Oh, you know. You know what you're doing. I mean, please. <laughs> this man knows exactly what he's doing. <laughs> the Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 378. It is uh, the first week of July now of 2024. I'm Ethan. Happy Independence Day, Crab fans. I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. Number 378. What do you know about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, WWE's WrestleMania doc. WrestleMania XL behind the curtain finally came out this week. And uh, I'll have to say it um, it looked pretty. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom Rinaldi of Fox Sports uh, doing the narration. I saw him pop up on one of those A&E specials mm -hmm. not long ago. I think he's a closeted fan, <laughs> uh, which I never would have guessed. It's like the sideline reporter for the NFL on Fox is a, is a wrestling fan. But anyway, it, it sounded good. It, it looked pretty. Mm -hmm. I want an hour of my life back. Uh, do you think Dwayne realizes that he had to produce a one hour documentary about how his ego almost wrecked a WrestleMania? <laughs> And do you re think he realizes how poorly he comes off in it? Well, I mean, we know that this documentary was supposed to come out three days after WrestleMania, and we're just now talking about it at time of recording on July 4th. So right. my feeling is that maybe it made him look even worse three months ago. <laughs> and God knows how. Um well, it's one of those things where the you can you can craft two choices in your mind for who Dwayne is coming out of the stock. And one is that he is so completely ignorant of anything that does not involve him that he was so stupid that he thought he could just waltz in and take on the main event of WrestleMania and interrupt a story that the company had been telling off and on, but been telling for two years and that nobody would be upset or even notice or care. Uh, right. Or he knew all of that and thought he could weather the storm and do it anyway, because he wanted it <laughs> in which case he's not ignorant, but he's a dick. So you create <laughs> a scenario of no wins for Dwayne in that story, even in this very carefully crafted quote unquote look behind the curtain that WWE gave us after a three month delay. Do you have a uh, big picture thoughts on this now that I've uh, just steamrolled and <laughs> and cut cut right to the quick. Do you have big picture thoughts on uh, the WrestleMania XL behind the curtain documentary? Not really. I mean it it you know it paints paints Cody in a pretty you know sympathetic light for the most part. Um, I I don't know. It's just a lot of people that are either good liars or have <laughs> have convinced themselves that what they say is the truth well enough. Um, I don't know. It didn't come off as like a particularly well run, as much as as much praise has been heaped upon Paul Levesque and the current creative division, and obviously in this case, the 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 story is that. Dwayne parachuted in and changed everything and then decided to change everything back once he saw the backlash. So it's not, you can't lash this all at Paul Levesque, but as the story is, Cody was going to win the Royal rumble and they just didn't know what they were going to do with them afterwards. <laughs> what are you doing, man? <laughs> and then uh, according to this, Cody wasn't supposed to like gesture towards Roman after winning the Royal rumble. It's like, well, why'd you have him win it then? <laughs> like, I don't know. It didn't come across as like quite the well-oiled machine of uh, of harmony that I feel like we have been hearing that the World Wrestling Federation has been since uh, Vince McMahon's departure. So 
uh, that kind of stuck out to me. But I mean, the the, the thing itself, like I don't know, it it it, it was fine. Um, beyond the the sort of timeline of events they lay out, I don't really feel like there's a lot of like juicy goss or or new nuggets we didn't know about in there. Um, I don't know. Did, did any other than as you said, you want an hour of your life back? Uh, did <laughs> did anything in particular stand out to you about their about their timeline of events or? <laughs> No, it really and it really doesn't make uh any sense. <laughs> um, uh the only like uh the the only moment where I was like okay, the wool is not being completely pulled over my <laughs> eyes here was Rollins had a line uh and god knows I have tried for many years not to like Seth Rollins, but <laughs> um, unfortunately, I've I've started to come around on him. Uh, he had a line in there about uh, getting all of those egos in a room when it was. Uh, I guess maybe when they were shooting the uh, the commercial for the tag match or whatever, mm-hmm. and it's him and Cody and Roman and The Rock and Triple H is there, and he's just talking about getting all those egos in a room. And it was code. He was speaking in code <laughs> and saying, yeah. hey, Dwayne came in and decided <laughs> he was going to redo everything. And then the fans wouldn't have it. Anyway, Rollins, uh, <laughs> with uh, a great read between the lines uh, <laughs> phrase there about getting off all four or five of those egos in one room. I don't know. I've come away with this more confused than ever about who is actually <laughs> running the World Wrestling Federation, whether it's uh, Nick Khan or um, Ari Emanuel or Dwayne Johnson or Paul Levesque. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it's Paul if Dwayne can just come in and change the WrestleMania main event and leave Paul going, I don't know what we're going to do with Cody yet. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it's Paul, that's for sure. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. Uh, except for the part where then they did the Royal Rumble, <laughs> Cody wins and points at the side and points at Roman, and it's like, well, I can't believe that he did that on his own <laughs> in this hyper controlled environment where they're rehearsing entrances, mm-hmm. <laughs> and Dwayne has to approve his pyro. <laughs> like, like what are we doing anyway uh n- nothing in the documentary that uh, explains why it took 4 months to come out uh nothing in the documentary that makes it worth 1 hour of your life <laughs> um but it looks pretty sounds nice and uh there's maybe one or two interesting behind the scenes nuggets there but uh, that's WrestleMania XL behind the curtain on WWE's YouTube channel. A lot, a lot of footage of Dwayne and his little glasses. If you, if you <laughs> like that, producer Dwayne, not 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 Dwayne the actor, Dwayne the wrestler, producer Dwayne. He's got his glasses on. He uh, he also man he thinks that he's like the director of the board, <laughs> and it's like he kept saying that he's as the director. Of, it's like no, you're on the board of directors you have one of like 13 seats <laughs> that that they're supposed to uh, provide counsel on the business future of this. Not, it doesn't give you carte blanche to come in <laughs> and, and make yourself the star of WrestleMania, but, and yet, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, didn't stop him from trying. Is, is the read between the lines. Also, if you are that, and your world famous superstar Dwayne Johnson, and you're really good friends with Nick Khan, who's actually running everything. You get to do that, maybe so. Yeah, yeah. They somehow they had to present like that. Paul was um more than just an empty suit, <laughs> and uh, more than guy, just a guy who's filling out TV formats. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he did a lot of talk about creating and how creating is important to him and uh, and, and space and uh, giving space for uh, for the audience to uh, for the audience to have their input. 
Uh, yeah. He, n- n- I don't think anyone except maybe Cody and Seth Rollins was like the number seven character in this documentary, <laughs> but I thought he came off pretty well, and I thought C- Cody came off okay. Um, yeah, just nothing here that <laughs> was worth an hour of your life. And you know what a fun little twist of fate. Who could have seen this coming? At the end of it all, the biggest match that's going to be made for next year's WrestleMania is again going to feature Dwayne Johnson. How about that? It is Dwayne and uh, Cody, for sure. That's the Mm -hmm. the biggest match they can do. Unless he decides he wants to wrestle Roman instead. And Cody can can wrestle... I don't know. (laughs) We'll figure something out. He'll wrestle one of the uh, 14... Samoan or slash Tongan guys they have under contract now. Sure. Um, that was the WrestleMania XL doc. Uh, Money in the Bank is coming up this weekend, and uh, we could talk a little bit about the build to this. To me, the weekly television shows have been better uh, in the WWE over the last month or so. Mm-hmm. Two SmackDowns in a row have been like all timers. Paul Heyman took a power bomb through the announce table. <laughs> Almost, he did finally pull the plug and realize I need to get away from these jabronis. Yes, <laughs> uh, it came. It came like three weeks later uh, since the last time that I mentioned this on the show. <laughs> He's usually smart enough not to associate with jabronis, <laughs> and so now he is off television. And uh, the Solo Sokoa bloodline. Which has Solo, Tamatonga, Tonga Loa, and Jacob Fett too, um, is is getting into gear, and then Paul and Roman will come back at some point with their own bloodline, maybe with a Tala Tonga or a Longa Tonga, and or, or uh, Jim Uso when he's healthy. Yeah, could even rope Jay back in because. The Usos are much better off together as a tag team than this. sure are. <laughs> I mean, the bell rings. <laughs> the, th- the thing is that that entrance that they love that Jay does, you could do that with him in a tag team just fine. Yeah, you know, wouldn't and uh, then as a result, you wouldn't have to then watch him wrestle after the cool entrance. You know, everybody yeah. wins. Yeah, you would think. You would think. I don't know. We'll get into this as we talk about money <laughs> in the bank. I just uh, speaking of our friend Cody, he is teaming with Randy Orton and Kevin Owens against three of the Bloodline guys. We don't know which three of uh, Solo Skoa, Tamatonga, Tangalo, and Jacob Fett two. Um, Randy keeps looking at that championship, but it sure doesn't seem like. Randy Orton should be wrestling Cody anytime in the next, I don't know, two months. Mm-mm. So uh, I don't know what we're doing here. Um, the bloodline should probably beat the baby faces and Randy or Kevin Owens should probably take a pin. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> based on everyone, I mean, Randy did just do a job, like a sort of a job as we talked about on our last show, I think to Carmelo Hayes, but You'd think you'd think it's probably Kevin Owens getting pinned by Solo Sokoa, and then you do Solo and Cody at at uh, SummerSlam, um, and maybe you shoot the big Roman return angle there, and uh, then after SummerSlam, you could move Cody away from the Samoans for the time being, and you could have Randy do the big turn. Then, um, you know, there's there's a lot of directions they could go, but I would say in the immediate, yeah, it's got to be. If you're going to do solo versus Cody, then he probably needs to pin. I would almost say he should pin Cody if you're really trying to make people take him seriously. But um, I feel like everybody's just kind of waiting for for Roman to come back, especially now that they've laid out Paul. So, uh, yeah, you can you can have solo beat either Randy Orton or Kevin Owens and then and then move on to a title match with Cody at uh, at the Summerfest. Do you like that? But you did. You, uh, did you like that Paul stuff? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was good. I mean, 
I got annoyed like in the days following when the New York Post is writing articles about how he should win an Emmy and stuff that no no wrestler deserves an Emmy. I'm sorry, no <laughs> person in wrestling deserves an Emmy. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was a good angle. It was also you know it kind of harkened back. It, it used to be when they went to Madison Square Garden, they'd at least shoot one really big angle when they were doing TV in Madison Square Garden. And then there were several years there where they just stopped doing that. And mm-hmm. as the square garden TVs were just like any other TVs, i.e. usually not very good. Mm-hmm. So this all, that kind of felt like a hearkening back. And it's also fascinating because as mentioned, they had just done the big bombastic debut of Jacob Fatu. And usually Paul Levesque and Bruce Pritchard's world wrestling federation it, there isn't usually storyline advancement on back-to-back shows. We get yes. like maybe one little bit forward a month usually in, in Paul and Bruce's world. So the fact that they had just done the big debut of Jacob Fatu the previous week and then came back with that big angle with, with Paul and, and him laying him out. I was like, wow, that's in a good way. It was surprising uh, both because it harkens back to how they used to treat the Madison Square Garden shows as a bigger deal, and also because just not used to seeing two big angles on back to back WWE shows. So, yeah, big thumbs up for that. We don't know how much of this to attribute to the new SmackDown head writer either, mm-hmm. uh, but it it feels like well, how could one person on on the writing team? When uh, Paul and Bruce have final say, how mm-hmm. could one person be in charge or one person be responsible for two good episodes of, uh, of SmackDown <laughs> in a row? And even I would say two more watchable WWE Raw shows than ever. Uh, so in the, in the last two weeks, mm-hmm. uh, at the same time, SmackDown got a new head writer. SmackDown all of a sudden has two of its best episodes in <laughs> the last four. 10 years <laughs> yeah so maybe maybe the new head writer guy deserves some credit i don't know yeah well we'll see i mean it's it's kind of like we talked we used to talk about this at length there was a time when smackdown was like especially horrendous and everyone just just pooped on road dog all the time because he was the <laughs> the head writer of smackdown at the time or the head the guy in the chair at smackdown at the time and Correct. I was like, well, it's Vince's show still. Like, and I know I think that was during maybe the time when Vince was trying to do the XFL. So Vince wasn't there every week. Right. So maybe you could argue Road Dog deserved a little bit more blame or credit, depending on if the show was good or bad, than the guy who's running SmackDown does now, if if Paul and Bruce are there every or, you know, every Friday. But yeah, as it stands, he's two for two so far. So I mean, if I were him, I'd be <laughs> I'd be trying to make make it that everyone's giving me credit and, and doing what I can to, uh, you know, keep that, keep that uh, streak alive. But yeah, obviously whether the shows are good or bad, generally the guys at the very top are the ones that are going to get the credit if it's good. So uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully that is the case. They are letting this guy uh, cook. If that's, if that's what's making the shows go well and also have things happen on them that's that's the major <laughs> headline for me is that things have happened on back-to-back episodes of friday night smackdown for the first time since i don't know 2009 the obama administration for yeah. sure yeah uh back to money in the bank here the intercontinental championship is on the line with Sami Zayn defending against braun breaker uh pretty simple push Brian Baker has Ultimate Warrior knockoff music, as we pointed mm-hmm. out. He comes out. He runs through everybody. Sami Zayn has been presented pretty strongly and allowed to, uh, you know, cut real traditional babyface promos. Uh, I think Sami's got to go here. Unfortunately, <laughs> I think. I think he got to try with uh, with uh, with Braun Breaker, and Sami doesn't need the Intercontinental Title. And he's had it for a good long time, and it's time to put him on Braun. What do you think? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, Braun should win, and he shouldn't lose for a long time. Uh, Sammy is is he, he, ironically because we talked a lot about how Becky Lynch saw herself as Mick Foley, even though she was Steve Austin. Correct. I think Mick, Sammy Zayn is kind of a Mick Foley type in that he's 
always a lot of times ends up way more over than his push, but ultimately he's not really the guy who gets the two year title reign either. Like you can have him win the belt. It's a great moment to have him win, you know, to topple Gunther after the two year reign. But as soon as that's done with, you can, you can kind of start looking for who the next guy you're going <laughs> to have run through Sammy to, to take the belt from him. So yeah, it's not going to hurt Sammy in the long run to lose the belt. And he still gets to be the guy that beat, beat Gunther and they can, you know, build to a return match with that or, or do whatever they want to do with Sammy after this. So yeah, I think it's definitely time for Braun to just win this title and, and keep going. Damian Priest defends the World Heavyweight Championship against Seth Rollins. They put some stipulations here on this. Seth can't challenge for the title again as long as Priest holds it if he loses. And if Priest loses, not only does he lose the title, he has to leave the Judgment Day. So we might actually get some resolution to the are they breaking up, are they not breaking up Judgment Day story. Uh, Judgment Day is intertwined with everything on Raw, yeah. Which, uh, which is sometimes rough when it's a three-hour show. And uh, you know, Liv Morgan, um, oh, just uh, <laughs> makes for some really uncomfortable television. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't know. Liv and Dom and Liv and or, or Liv and Finn secretly in cahoots are Liv and Dom secretly in cahoots. Not so, I mean, they're doing a pretty poor job of keeping a secret mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, if, if that's the case. Anyway, uh, just any thoughts in general on uh, Liv Morgan and uh, her character <laughs> who, as we've discussed, is uh, the Liv Morgan, if you were to ask Liv Morgan what her character is, she would say, I'm a very sexy baby. <laughs> um, and we started saying I started saying that uh, we, my wife started saying that uh, long before uh, Taylor Swift had a line in a song about being a very sexy baby. Uh, so I would like to think that uh, Taylor Swift owes me some royalties. But also, uh, what do you think about uh, Seth Rollins versus Damian Priest for the World Heavyweight Championship? Well, first of all, just to clarify, the line is not about her being a sexy baby. It's that she feels everyone around her is a sexy baby. Let's just just to make that clear. Okay. Uh, sec second of all, uh... sure. <laughs> well, I listened to it. I listened to that album once. That's fine. It's a very <laughs> popular song. Um, okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I don't know why I, I used got, to be better know. at pop culture. <laughs> I don't know why I got worked up about that, but I felt it was important to uh, to clarify the nature of that that line in her song. It's hey. it's strange verbiage to end up in a very in a uh, in the most popular musical artist in the world's uh, uh, catalog. Is it not? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, no no arguments there. Okay. Uh, regardless, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't enjoy anything that <laughs> that Liv Morgan has done on television for when did she win the title in Cash and Money in the Bank? That was probably like two years ago now. I don't know, man. Um I think Time it was flies. A, yeah, it was it was a while ago, which was a nice moment because it seemed to make Michael Cole happy at the time. Um I don't know. <laughs> people see people seem to like her. Um the storyline I don't like. It's not a storyline I would do if if my company were currently named in a sexual harassment lawsuit. Um, but they're doing it, and I, I don't know. It's just, yeah. I guess I would like there to be, <laughs> as far as how this relates to Seth and Damian having a match for the world title. Um, yeah, I guess I guess I would like there to be some advancement, whether it's live in dom or live in live in finn or or both or whatever just do something with it so we could we could get on with this <laughs> um and yeah i mean i i don't know i don't know what you do with damian priest if he's not part of this group because that sounds like you're he's gonna get screwed over by his team and you're gonna turn him you know the classic baby face turn because he got his ass beat 
by his other heel friends. Uh, I don't, I don't love his chances of, you know, being a, being a big star outside of that group, but he also feels really stale. And it's like, what do you do with Seth if he's not the world champion on that show? Like, I don't know. I guess he could feud with Gunther without the belt if you want to do that. I don't know. It's it's just it. I mean, neither neither option. Damian Priest being the world champion or Seth Rollins being the world champion. Neither of those scenarios uh, light my world on fire. But perhaps, depending on who wins the briefcase, maybe we won't have to see an, either of them be world champion for too much longer. Problem. Well, there's many problems with this, but there the problem with Damian Priest is a baby face. He ain't over as a heel, <laughs> despite carrying this world title around for months and months. He's not over as a heel. And then, as you mentioned, if you do the he- the baby face turn, where he's only a baby face because all of his heel friends <laughs> destroy him. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for people to get too excited about Damian Priest. <laughs> no, no, it would not. This is fraught with uh, this is just a lot of terrible ideas. I, don't I mean, know. I guess if they turn on him, and it's like Liv, Dom, and Finn are the new Judgment Day, like the new Rockers, um, and then Bria can come back when she's healthy as a baby face, and like she and Priest can start a new group, I guess, as like a baby, a goth baby face group. I don't know. Sure, why not? That I mean, that would. That would fulfill one of WWE's favorite things, which is to just have a group of people with one girl fight each other for six months. So that's one of Paul Levesque's favorite things to do currently. So sure. just start another one with, you know, Priest and Rhea and you get, you know, whoever you're not currently doing anything with on the television and put them. So you have an equal amount of, of people in, in the group so they can feud with the new Judgment Day or crosses group or or whoever else the god of del fantasma whoever you know whoever you need sure all right the uh it's only a five match show so we're already uh at the uh money in the bank ladder matches uh the in the women's money in the bank ladder match uh eo sky chelsea green lyra valkyria tiffany stratton naomi and the either 30 or 50 year old Zoe Stark, one of the two. <laughs> uh people were people were salty that uh, they didn't put Dakota Kai in this match, apparently. All right. Well, that's just a case of everyone on the internet's hormones <laughs> telling them who the best wrestler is. And look, as I've mentioned before, we've all been there. I think at some point in our lives, our hormones have allowed us or influenced us as to who uh-huh. we think the best wrestler is. Sure. And and God bless Dakota Kai. Sure. Remember when Bret Hart said Melina was the best wrestler in the world? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> Could have happened to any of us, you know? Yeah. For sure. Um uh, yeah. That I, I think that's just everyone's hormone speaking. <laughs> and uh everyone loves Dakota Kai. Yeah. I feel bad that they put her on an airplane with that giant knee brace for like six months Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and made her travel as she was trying to rehab a torn ACL. Um, Yeah. Does she deserve better than her push? Probably. Uh, I don't particularly care, but she's not in this match. (laughs) That's just me. Well, but she wasn't going to win. So like, (laughs) what does it matter? (laughs) Like, Right. No offense. Zoe Stark needs all the help she can get. Sure. And she'll do, you know, <laughs> she's the Zoe Stark will be in the match to do something, you know, somewhat athletic off a ladder or whatever. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a ladder match. The winner of which will win the raw or SmackDown women's championship. Uh, neither one of us. I, I just like what, Dakota Kai, n- neither Dakota Kai nor Zoe Stark is going to win this match. So what does it really matter? No. Naomi's not going to win it either. Mm-mm. I couldn't Tiffany believe Stratton... a match, honestly. <clears throat> well, she's barely won a match. Since she's back. That's true. Uh, Tiffany Stratton is probably going to win. Lyra Valkyria could win. Chelsea Green, outside chance if you want to put it on a heel. 
and uh, Eos guy, um, she's had it before, and uh, probably is just there to do a moonsault off the ladder. Mm-hmm. So I would say Stratton the favorite, Valkyria uh, an underdog, and then Chelsea Green a dark horse. Is that uh, fair handicapping here? Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that all makes sense. Um, Chelsea, it feels like you could do a lot of shtick with that. You know, she could do her. Mm -hmm. She keeps talking about how she wants a bedazzled briefcase and all that. So it's like, yeah, that would. I think there would be a greater than average chance that Chelsea would be the one to win if someone else was currently in charge of this company. Uh, But yeah, I don't know. But then again, he fired her twice, so maybe not. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think I think Chelsea would make sense if you actually want someone to have the briefcase for a while and possibly also someone that you could have cash in and lose. That's what y- you could do that. If you want to actually try and make a new star, then yeah, you would give it to either Tiffany or Lyra. Men's Money in the Bank ladder match, they've kind of only presented Jey Uso as having a chance of winning it, <laughs> which... Uh... Mm-hmm. Which uh, seems like a bad idea to me. Seems like bad booking too. Uh, Jey Uso, <laughs> Carmelo Hayes, Andrade, Chad Gable, L.A. Knight, yeah, and Drew McIntyre. I'm sure McIntyre's in this match for some kind of CM Punk angle again. Mm-hmm. L.A. Knight, runner up, but uh, he's still feuding with Logan Paul. Mm-hmm. Chad Gable. Let's get real Andrade he's got spooky generational horror cinema to be doing on raw he doesn't need the briefcase that's true Andrade police he's the WWE speed champion he has commitments uh that go far beyond being the world's champion yeah Carmelo Hayes he rolled up Randy Orton to get to get in this match mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh jay uso who started talking about winning money in the bank like a month before money in the bank build started like they were still building to the last pay-per-view mm-hmm. so i th- i think jay uso is winning what do you think yeah i guess i mean i wouldn't for all no the i wouldn't we already talked about but yeah like you said it's either him or drew and it sure seems like this is a, a prime, another prime opportunity to do the thing they've been doing for six months, which is Drew almost wins a big match and then Punk gets involved and costs him the title or costs him the match. So you can do that pretty easily and and keep uh, and keep that feud alive. And then, I mean, I get, if a heel, if if I guess if God Damian Priest versus Jey Uso or Seth Rollins versus Jey Uso, that sounds dreadful <laughs> but again i guess you could have jay win it and then if he's a baby face you could have him like do the rob van dam cash in and like cash it in for SummerSlam or something and then again you could have him lose i'm trying to find a scenario where jay uso isn't the world champion uh but i'm striking out because it seems pretty likely now that you've laid it all out that way well, you got G- Gunther's going to wrestle the, the champion already at uh, at SummerSlam because they gave the King of the Ring oh, winners right. title shots. So, um, I mean, yeah, one way to do that would be to have him cash in and make it a three way or whatever. But that sounds just just sounds bad. I think they're just going to put it on somebody and then basically forget that they have it for <laughs> 10 months. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it. In, in that instance, sure, Jey Uso can carry around a briefcase for 10 months. Why not? Sure. And we'll, we'll worry about how to book our way out of it later. We'll see if Dwayne has any ideas when he gets back. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. He's, uh, he's very busy right now. <laughs> All right, so that's, uh, that's Money in the Bank. That's Saturday night. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. We need, to talk, we need to talk about that Dwayne uh, Christmas movie trailer. We should have talked about it last week. It's going to be the worst movie of all time. There is a uh, another uh, Dwayne did a did a Christmas movie for uh, Netflix, I think. Right. We've had this conversation. It, Red Notice was not a Christmas movie. We've had this conversation before on the show. OK. All right. 
This is called Red Alert or something, though. Yes. It's just... It's a very similar title. Uh, the, the Red Notice is the one with the big egg that, that Vincent Mann was carrying around, if you remember. Right, right, right. Yeah. So now he's done one for Amazon. And this was the big Hiram Garcia idea, right? Yes, this is uh, this was the one that there was. I think I think it predated the the more recent article about how Dwayne is unprofessional and late all the time and pisses in bottles and stuff. There was an article Voss that came, water bottles. Yes, the Voss water bottles specifically, and uses filming time to film uh, commercials for the XFL and his tequila brand. There yep. was an article like a few months before that. That was all about just this specific Amazon slash MGM studios Christmas movie and how the budget had ballooned and it was out of control. And it's partially Dwayne's fault and partially the fault that the person in charge of it, the directors and producers on the the director and the producers on the film are just like inexperienced and don't know how to handle a production. And this is going to be a disaster. And, and all of that so they they finally put out a trailer for this one yes red red one every every joke is something happens on screen and then chris evanson's character goes did that just whatever happened like it's just it's that it's every bad like joss whedon punchline from 2007 every line read is like as flat as humanly possible there's like nobody there's a lot of like talented theoretically charismatic people jk simmons is in this dwayne johnson is in this chris evans is in this every line ring just as flat as possible nobody looks like they were filmed on the same day it looks like you just did like their side of the scene and then you shot the other person sign the following day and then just green screened it together it looks dreadful and i think everyone involved should be ashamed and hopefully bankrupted by the whole process what do you think about uh jail time uh yeah no that's good we can we can we can tack that on as well in addition to the shaming and the bankruptcy. All right, uh, NXT Heat Wave is coming up on Sunday. <laughs> Had a five minute aside on a Dwayne. <laughs> Seriously, that trailer came out like three months ago. I <laughs> you're like this like came two out, weeks. This <laughs> came out the other week. <laughs> it came out like I... two weeks ago, I think. All right. I'll let you have it. Whatever. Uh, Heat Wave is coming up on Sunday. I know you follow NXT very closely. And so I don't have to tell you, but the main event of this is a four-way for the NXT Championship with Trick Williams defending against the bounciest wrestler, Javon Evans, mm-hmm. Ethan Page, and Sean Spears. I don't know uh, if you've uh, watched a bunch of the weekly TV or... <laughs> you know. They just, you know the they, just they just call Javon Evans the bounciest wrestler and they talk about how bouncy he is Uh and it's like i have never once heard a wrestler described as bouncy and now every week multiple times a week i have vic joseph yelling at me (laughs) about how bouncy this 20 year old kid javon evans is uh he's a extremely charismatic he's shoot 20 years old he should win the championship at some point, but Trick Williams should be like in the middle of a star making career making run here. And so I don't think that it's time to take it off trick. And you can have Ethan Page and Sean Spears uh, eat a pin or both. He could stack them up and pin them for all I care. <laughs> I was going to say, if you weren't like riveted by the previous NXT show that was headlined by just Ethan Page in a singles match. Ugh. I got Ethan Page and Sean Spears in the same match, really just brimming with star power in NXT currently. Ethan Page is in, uh, in the Dakota Kai camp, I think. People like <laughs> people like him. Because they're horny for him. Oh. I thought I that was the implication that. of the hormones thing from earlier. Yeah, I forgot about that part. I think people like Dakota because she's nice too. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, there is definitely a thing where people are very, just very horny for Dakota Kai. Sure. Uh, I, I don't mean that about Ethan Page. Okay. Um, although maybe people he's, are. He's a handsome I don't guy. I don't know. I, all right. Uh, he, he became a body guy at some point. He was a tubby kid with a big square head <laughs> uh, for like a good oh, long time him. there <laughs> and then uh and then he uh and then he started working on it, working out with uh cesar bononi and actually he got in shape well before that but now he's you know the cesar bononi guy 
he's the um he's the body guy now. He's the guru. He's like All... he's he's CrossFit DDP. <laughs> yeah. Uh Dasha's going to him. Renee's going to him. Uh Ethan Page works out with him. I'm sure there are more people, but uh, and he and he and Eddie Kingston were working together. There you go. Um, yeah, there's somebody else. I think there's somebody else in uh, either. I think in WWE I saw recently working with him, but I can't remember who now. But yeah, he's a trainer to the stars. What do you know about that? Um, yeah, uh, people like Ethan Page, but Ethan Page couldn't get off the bench in AEW in like three years. <laughs> Like he couldn't even get on ROH regularly. <laughs> it's like yeah. what? You just listen to his promos, and it's just, ugh, there's no money in this guy. I, I'm sorry, there's just not. And you, maybe he can teach you things about how to do a, your own YouTube channel or how you can get over on the internet. Sure. Um, I I don't. I'm not saying he's completely without merit. I just mm-hmm. he's mostly without merit. All right. Uh, Roxanne Perez defending the women's title against Lola Vice. Uh, Lola Vice is a baby face who should be a heel. <laughs> Roxanne Perez is a heel who should be a baby face. <laughs> this is, uh, we want everybody to learn how to play every role before we put them on the main roster. Sure. I have no problem with, uh, with that in theory. Um, Roxanne and Lola, uh, I don't know. Any thoughts? I saw the promo from this week's show where Lola was like crying in the ring. People uh, liked that. I didn't, but people did. Oh, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad people <laughs> enjoyed that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't. I like. I said. I, I'm. Vi- I'm aware from watching the <laughs> pay per views that yeah. who Lola Vice is, and sure. from you know people's social tweets. media. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah. If you were like, who should be the baby face? Who should be the heel looking at her and Roxanne and knowing that I, I've seen a lot more of Roxanne's career than I have of Lola's, I would say, well, yeah, obviously, <laughs> obviously Roxanne should be the baby face. At least with Roxy, there's the thing of like, she's very young still, despite having been around for several years. And so there is probably more value in her and keeping her to learn how to work heel once before calling her up. Sure. Uh, but yes, as as when you put her against another intentionally sort of miscast character, it does kind of just scream the very glaring out, glaringly obvious thing that uh, Roxanne's going to be a big baby face. And this role is quite forced of her, <laughs> her trying to look mean, like... <laughs> Like it's just it's a, it's almost comical, but she's she's five foot one. Mm-hmm. She, that's generous. Uh, <laughs> five one. She's twenty two years old. Uh, she's absolutely cute as a button <laughs> with uh, uh, animated a- a Japanese anime cartoon panda eyes. Yeah, <laughs> she she looks like a Disney Channel actress. Like like <laughs> like she just doesn't look like someone that could be mean like i don't know <laughs> not I that agree. i'm sure there aren't mean disney channel actresses but you know what i mean no i agree wholeheartedly yeah all right uh obafemi versus wesley for the north american championship there's also a stipulation attached to this one where wesley who i think might be Shawn michael's son uh <laughs> he can't challenge like how gino hernandez was uh <laughs> yes was gary hart's son <laughs> He, uh, uh, Paul Bosch, Paul Bosch, so, sorry, yeah, yeah, not Gary Hart, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Shawn Michaels books Wesley the way that Vince McMahon books Shawn Michaels. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it that way, uh, yeah, so if Wes loses, he can't challenge for the NXT North American Championship again. I don't think it's time to uh, to beat uh, Oba here unless we're uh, he's gonna challenge Trick next. Which I would be fine with also, by the way, because he is super, super over. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, they should book him like Bill Goldberg, and they tend not to book anyone like Bill Goldberg. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, Kalani Jordan defending the Women's North American Championship against Sol Ruka. Sol, uh, this is a babyface match. 
Um, and again, with two super just natural baby faces, uh, I, I don't know exactly what's going on here. <laughs> um, uh, Soul shouldn't be a heel. Kilani shouldn't be a heel. Uh, maybe they'll just have a nice match and no one will turn on the other one. But uh, I don't know. My radar is going off. Nathan Fraser and Axiom defending the NXT tag titles against uh, Chase Hughes, Andre Chase, and Duke Hudson. Uh, the 57-year-old college student, college professor slash college students. Uh, they're teasing Fraser and Axiom breaking up with Fraser like getting a big head and uh, Axiom wanting him to concentrate on their wrestling matches. The backstage uh, skits on NXT, uh, like the dialogue they write for these people, it's like the, it's uh, it's it's below like bad parody of early 2000s. WB slash CW uh, uh, teen dramas. Wow, <laughs> it's it's the worst. They make them they 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 treat these grown adult, young adult, but grown adult wrestlers as if they're uh, children. And the dialogue they have is of children. Anyway, um, yeah, we'll see how that plays out. And then uh, Carmen Petrovic and Ariana Grace versus JC Jane and Jasmine Nix on the pre-show. JC. To me, should be someone in a group, not someone leading a group with an underling. She's, I don't know, she's doing the the face mask gimmick too, the uh, the uh, the Trish Stratus face mask gimmick. Carmen Petrovic and Ariana Grace are. And this is a match of uh, all heels, <laughs> but Ariana Grace is uh, Santina Morella's daughter, oh. and uh, she's uh, she's funny. Like she's not a good wrestler, but she's funny. So <laughs> just like chip off the old block, huh? Yeah, exactly. And she was a beauty queen of some kind too. So she's like it does a beauty queen gimmick. Some kind. <laughs> What's that? Like a regional beauty queen. <laughs> I don't know if you were intending to put her down when you said that. <laughs> but calling her a beauty queen of some kind. <laughs> Really, really feels like you're twisting the knife a little bit. No, I wasn't. All right, for here, okay. Here's why I wouldn't do that is because I know that like she's from Ontario, and it's like, well, Toronto's ladies are just some of the finest in the world, no doubt. Uh, And so, and so, I didn't mean it that way. I was just (laughs) like, that's just how I speak. Right. She was Miss Saskatchewan. (laughs) Her competition was a moose. (laughs) <laughs> and a lady who had died of frostbite. <laughs> I can't top that. That's the that's I can't. That's, I mean, that was just hilarious. <laughs> that was just you being hilarious. I can't can't add anything to it. All right. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, WWE's big weekend here coming up in Toronto. They've got SmackDown Friday night in Toronto. And then uh, Money in the Bank Saturday night. Then Heat Wave. Sunday night. AEW had Forbidden Door this past weekend. Um, I had a day off, and so I was not watching the entire Forbidden Door show. I saw the same part of the pay-per-view, basically from Jericho's match on. I saw that twice. Um, So anyway, I probably don't have a ton of thoughts about, about this show. But uh, what did you think of Forbidden Door uh, 2024? Um, I thought it was a really easy to watch show. Uh, I skipped the pre-show. Uh, I was watching the Orioles on Sunday Night Baseball, which also turned out to be a mistake. Uh, it was the one game they lost against the Rangers last weekend. But uh, yeah, I watched that. I watched baseball up until eight o'clock. So I just joined the regular show uh, as it was starting. Um, not a great deal of like matches if you watch AEW pay-per-views with the expectation that you're going to see at least one like match of the year candidate match, I guess you could argue that Osprey and, and Swerve had that caliber of a match. Um, the rest of the show, I didn't think anything on it was bad, uh, but I didn't, I wasn't overly wowed. I was kind of impressed by how much, 
uh, the Elite and Okada versus Tanahashi and Acclaimed got out of so little as a match very early on in the show. Uh, they basically just built the whole match around Tanahashi trying to get his hands on Okada and Okada running away from him. Um, and people were super into that. Um, so and then, and then Okada beat Tanahashi again. So uh, yeah, I thought it was a, a fine show up and down. People were really into uh, the top matches on the show. But other than the main event, I don't think there's a lot on this show I will remember in, say, seven more days from now. Whoops, there we are. I was muted. A 15-match show. Do we need 15-match shows? Uh, no. I mean, there's there's <laughs> definitely stuff you could have you could have cut off. Like I said, I didn't watch the pre-shows, so... It wasn't quite that long to me, but if you were watching from the start of the the pre-show to then, then yeah, uh, I look and apparently, I mean, I, I heard the the Lucha Bros and Mystico versus the Lij guys was like a really fun match, and I you could probably have swapped that onto the show with one of the matches that wasn't so entertaining. But you also had things like MJF versus Hechicero. No, that match didn't need to be there, but the show was in Long Island, and. Uh, so that's why that match was there. Uh, so it's fine. Uh, like I said, I, I did the show could have, you probably could have shaved two or three matches off that, that show. And it would have been fine. Uh, would have been a better show. Maybe as far as from a runtime, this one didn't go quite as late as the Memorial day weekend one did, but it was, it was still long. Um, but the crowd was got up for, for swerve and Osprey in a way they weren't really, into a lot of other things on the show. I thought the crowd was very up and down. Not necessarily like it's their fault for not being a good crowd, but uh because like I said, I thought the show was pretty bang average. But um yeah, they they got up for the main event at least. So they <laughs> they they cared about certain things and they really they really didn't like uh they decided about a quarter of the way into the Mercedes uh Monet Stephanie Vicar double title match that they hated Mercedes because she was from Boston. And uh, so that kind of, they spent more of the time just crapping on Boston sports teams than they did actually cheering for Stephanie Vacare. But I mean, Hey, it felt like she, that was really her first big introduction to an American audience. And she seems to have passed that test and, and got some good word of mouth coming out of the show from that. So um, yeah, that, that seemed to go well. And the, the Tony and, uh, Mina share Carol match, I thought was pretty good as well. So some of the lesser knowns, the non older new Japan talent that the crowd probably didn't know as well, seem to seem to make out on the show pretty well, as far as being introduced to a wider audience. Big booking thing coming out of this was that, uh, Swerve beat Will Ospreay, sure uh, did. Any thoughts? Time to beat Will? Time to establish Swerve as the guy? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I kind of got the feeling going into the show that Swerve was winning. Um, But, look, I wouldn't have been upset if you had just had Will win because it sure does feel like Will's main eventing a lot of these shows and is one of, one of if not the most pushed character on every show he's on, so that person might as well be the world champion. But yeah, if you want S- Swerve to have a longer reign than having him beat those types of top guys and not having him squirreled away, like, you know, like WWE booking Punk as the champion and then having, you know, him never wrestle Batista or Cena or any of those guys. Uh, like that's not a, that's not a good way that just doesn't help anyone so uh yeah put those guys in direct conflict and if you're going to give swerve a long reign and possibly a, a big marquee main event match at the at the wembley show then he should be going over everybody and including top top guys like will osprey right now so yeah i mean i don't i don't think it's a a problem that you lose to the world champion like i don't I, and i don't really feel like will osprey is a character that needs to win every match either. So I I'm fine with it as, as an idea um, follow up as always will be key, but as a concept, yeah, sure. Uh, he's the world champion. He beat the guy. There's 
tiny bits of chicanery where it seemed like maybe Will had a chance to win. There were ref bumps. Um, and he almost used the Tiger driver and then didn't. So they they gave Will a little bit of an out because he was distracted by the main character of AEW, Don Callis, and uh, and all of that. So they, they didn't completely... Uh, ether will and just have Swerve completely beat him clean, but it was also very decisive by the end where Swerve just hit hit one more kick and pinned him. So, yeah. All right. Well, uh, before we move on, anything else uh, from Forbidden Door stand out? Um, MJF beat Hechicero, right? As you would expect. Danielson beat Shingo, as you would expect. Good match, but nothing spectacular. Yep. Uh, you already discussed um, the elite and Tanahashi and uh, the acclaimed mm-hmm. and what they did. Zach Saber beat Orange Cassidy. Okay, I, I wouldn't have Orange Cassidy lose to. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's like a fate. Maybe they're really going to shove Zach Saber this year and, and the rest of the year in New Japan when this is like a favor. But Orange Cassidy probably loses too much for the level of over he is. That's fair. Uh, Jericho put a uh, hook over on the pay per view and then stomped his ass down on dynamite. Mm-hmm. The old veteran trick. <laughs> Lose, do do a clean job on the pay per view that a hundred thousand people watch, and then uh, lay the guy out on the television show that mm-hmm. seven hundred thousand people watch. Sure. Uh, Jack Perry won the TNT title in a ladder match where no one died. That eh. that is worth mm-hmm. talking about just because the, the only two people that really got pushed going into that match as like characters on this on the television were Jack Perry and Mark Briscoe. And the only person, the most over person in that match was to was Takeshita. <laughs> like by far. Takeshita got the biggest reaction. Every time he climbed the ladder, people went crazy because they wanted him to win. They reacted to every spot he did in the match so much more over for all that like they're clearly setting something for like don Callis, where kyle and kyle fletcher is going to be the new will osprey that becomes like the top focused person in the don Callis family fine you could do that if you want to do that get to cash out of there (laughs) he needs to he needs to be separated from that and they should be doing more with him uh because Fans, even this Long Island crowd that wasn't super into like everything on the show was so into him and everything he was doing. It's like it's starting to feel like promotional malpractice to not do more with that guy. It's fair. Uh, Mercedes beat Stephanie Vacker, as we talked about. Uh, I would have. I would have done. Simpler stuff. <laughs> Um. Yeah, I would have done some more stuff. The problem to me, and I don't know if it's um language barrier or just unfamiliarity of opponents, or a lot of these guys and girls only wrestle once a week now. Um, so I don't really know what the deal is. Uh, but a lot of the spots that like reversals or things that require spots that require a lot of communication stuff. And this is up and down the card, but I noticed it specifically in the Mercedes Vacker match is um, any, any spot that required communication or like reversing a whip or whatever uh, didn't go very smoothly. So there was a news note about Stephanie not getting into town until very late. So they also probably had minimal time to put the match together as well, which may have already, as you mentioned, combined with those other things probably did not help. That's fair. Naito beat Moxley. (sighs) This was, in my opinion, perhaps the worst pay-per-view match of both men's career. Yep, not uh, good. Uh, well, Moxley had that one in WWE with Jericho that was really dreadful. Uh, remember that cage they had that was just awful? Yes. Uh, that maybe is the only thing I could think of that was worse for Moxley. Uh, Naito, look, I myself made the argument last year when Naito won the G1 that it was still worth it to push Naito because 
listen to the crowds when he's yeah. out there. In and Japan. Yeah. And, right. In Japan, certainly. <laughs> I think that time, like the time where that, that crowd reaction is worth watching him screw up really simple stuff and just, he just, he can't run. He can't, he can almost do nothing. Like it was, and it felt like Moxley figured out pretty early on this guy can't do nothing. And so he wasn't trying very hard either. So I don't want to put it all on Naito, but I just came away from that of being like, that you you don't have it's like Tanahashi. We we just we started talking in like 2017 about how Tanahashi's best days were behind him. Yeah. But he still had like another three or four years where his timing was good enough and he was still so over that he could still be a main eventer when they needed him to be. I don't think Naito has that. I think he's done now and him winning the world title at the end of this. Again, you had to get it back on a new Japan guy because the G1 is starting, but woof, this was brutal. It was a really bad night of the office for both guys. And again, I don't put it all on Naito, but I put a lot of it on Naito because there was a lot of a lot of just simple things being screwed up in this match. And we just got some made event already. So uh that's that. That was Forbidden Door. And then on Dynamite this week, MJF turned heel again. Uh seems long overdue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get I get why you bring him back as a baby face because obviously he was going to get cheered after being gone for six months or whatever. But um, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was time. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen with uh, with poor old Adam Cole when he uh, when he finally comes back, but that doesn't seem to be happening anytime soon. So uh, in the meantime, baby face uh, MJF was not exactly uh, lighting anyone's world on fire. And obviously they're setting him up. And also you just need heels. Like you need top heels right now in that company. Um, Heels that aren't (laughs) ironic. uh, Wink at the crowd heels like Jericho and the Bucks are. Um, You need like actual top heels that can, that people care about. So um, yeah, I think it's long overdue. And I think, him versus Osprey and Swerve versus either Hangman or Danielson is a pretty good one-two punch main event for your for your big stadium show. Yep. So the uh, the Owen Hart finals are coming up next week. We didn't talk about Britt Baker coming back. Britt Baker oh, yeah. came back. Um, we're doing the Britt Baker Mercedes Monet feud. Um, Britt Baker's been gone for a long time. She explained why on uh, Dynamite. I don't know. There are a lot of rumors going around about why Britt Baker was not on television, and it may have started out as an injury, but the subtext was she was not happy with a lot of booking ideas was the subtext. (laughs) I think she was, like, tweeting about stuff she didn't like last fall. Like, I mean, that wasn't necessarily all her creative either. She was I think specifically criticizing the booking of Adam Cole being <laughs> involved in angles while his uh, while he was on crutches and stuff, but it wasn't all her own booking she was complaining about. But she was she was being a little verbal about you know her own her own stuff and other things on the show that it seems she was not a fan of. Yeah, so then she comes back and she uh, explains. Well, I had a mini stroke and. Uh... I need to get right. And Tony Khan gave me time to get right. And here I am. So I think that's uh, a perfectly reasonable kayfabe explanation. <laughs> and we'll just maybe never know the full truth about why Brit was not on television for like 10 months or whatever. Uh, but uh, Brit's back. He's going to wrestle Mercedes. Mercedes is the clear heel. They aligned her with uh, the bad Young Bucks act mm-hmm. on uh, very briefly on Dynamite this week. And then uh, Britt is the baby face who explained that she had a mini stroke. So uh, that, that'll that be fun, though. Well, it's interesting because I think both Britt and Mercedes in Uh-oh. the long term will be better off as he was. Oh, <laughs> but sure. For right now, Britt is the homegrown. We were talking recently about 
you know, there are not a ton of really fully homegrown AEW stars you can look at five years on. Britt is certainly one of them. Um, so she's she's and now she is being positioned against this new person that is painted with very strong WWE colors uh, coming in and has been pushed very hard and is winning all her matches and has won two belts already since she's been back. Um, and that's a really easy story for fans to sink their teeth into. And yeah, so immediately, yeah, Brit should be the baby face and Mercedes should be the heel. Um, I was maybe a little survive- surprised by how overt they went with it because they avoided this route when they put Mercedes against Willow a couple of months ago of having it be, you know, that overtly. She clearly played up her, you know, her heelish qualities to in that feud but they did not fully pull the trigger yet but obviously they didn't want to leave any doubt <laughs> uh who the baby face is in this feud so uh yeah that's probably for the best for right now and will the match be good who knows but it is a match between two very big stars heading towards your theoretically your biggest show of the year the stadium show in Wembley so yeah, it's uh, it's it's good. It'll be good. It'll probably be good television leading up to it, at least. Just very briefly. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem with making Mercedes a heel is that yes, she's a natural heel. Like, should almost always be a heel. But the problem is she's so good at being a heel. That eventually, after a little while, she's going to start getting cheered because she's so good at being a heel. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. And then Brit, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, oh, natural heel. She has resting bitch face. She is a heel. But then she's so good at being a heel. And with her, you have the added element of, the uh, oh, she's the homegrown AEW person. She's been here since day one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eventually, she gets cheered, too. So... I don't know what we do with this. There's two natural heels who both always end up getting cheered as heels. I don't know what you do. Yeah. It doesn't I mean, matter. It doesn't yeah. matter necessarily, but yeah. Sure. For for the short term, <laughs> it'll work. Long term, who knows? Right. All right. Well, again, I feel I've said too much. <laughs> is there uh, anything else you'd like to discuss here? I would just like to remind you that Ethan is the one who said that uh <laughs> Baker has has resting bitch face. I didn't say that. Um, well, look, I have gone so far as to put her full title, Doctor DMD, in headlines because I don't want heat with Britt Baker. <laughs> Seems like a very bad person to have heat with. And so I, throughout my career, have gone out of my way not to piss off. Britt Baker, and so I'm sorry if saying that she has resting bitch face uh, does that. It, it's a common turn of phrase. I just, I just <laughs> thought it was funny. Uh, well, there you go. Anyway, no, I think that the, that about covers the big things. You know, AW's got this blood and guts show in a couple of weeks that now they're building to. They have four of the elite members. Hangman is back, but not aligned with the elite immediately. I think there could be a way you get him onto that team to be the fifth guy anyway, without aligning him directly with the elite. If say Matt and Nick help him beat Danielson in exchange for his services for the night or whatever. Um, and then we don't know the baby face team. I assume Swerve will be on the baby face team because he said he would a few weeks ago. Um, but the only official person named right now is Mark Briscoe. So the ROH champion is on Team AEW. So they're building to blood and guts first, and then after that, I guess we'll really hit the ground running for Wembley a few weeks after that. All right, well, until next time, everybody, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling play. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features.
Um, have we uh, done a show since uh, the presidential debate? No, I think we recorded just prior to it starting <laughs> last week. What did you think? What did you think of uh, the uh, our uh, our undead president? <laughs> was, I mean, it was awful. I don't. <laughs> I don't know how anyone could watch that. And uh, do you replace him? Yeah, <laughs> I, th- I think so. <laughs> I mean, look, it would be pretty unprecedented. Sure. But also, um, if as their constant fundraising uh, emails and texts suggest that you believe uh, democracy is on the line in this in this next election here. um. Well, I sure wouldn't run the guy who apparently doesn't function well after the hours of 4 p.m. every day. Sure. It's like a bad idea. Um, so I guess the, the minutia of going down that road is, does he quit the race and resign as president? Or do you try to just have him quit the race and he rides out this last however many months until January? where you can hopefully, you know, anoint Kamala and whoever as the uh as the new president. I don't know. I it's it like I said, it would be almost impossible but also when like MSNBC is talking about it, it feels a little bit more real <laughs> because generally speaking the Democratic Party cares a lot more about what MSNBC and New York Times columnists think than they do about uh, anyone else in the country so oh a thousand percent yeah um so the fact that they're all saying it and they're still saying it like i thought i thought okay they're gonna talk about this for the night because of how bad the night was and then the next day everything will be fine but it's over a week on now and we're still talking about it like it could be a real thing that should happen so um yeah i don't know it would be it would be shocking and unprecedented but i just it's like he requested that the debate happen this early for the express purpose of like putting people's minds at ease about his mental state. And then he did that. So yeah, I mean, I think it's either way. It feels like it's time to panic, but (laughs) um, you're, you're being a little bit late to recording allowed me uh time to eat another hot dog and uh, a few more uts carolina barbecue chips so oh. those chips are so tremendous and they're difficult to find apparently these days yeah sometimes they just appear in the house i never see them when i <laughs> when i when i go to stores myself but uh yeah they're uh, a, r- a real delicacy and, yeah uh, that Took a walk today, drank three white claws. Everything's great. So let's nice. <laughs> oh yeah. I accidentally bought green apple thinking it was lime. Turns Ugh. out I like the green apple ones though. So. <laughs> Everything's Ooh. coming up Millhouse. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a nice that's a nice story. That had an an, an unexpected ending. <laughs> an unexpected happy ending. Yeah, I was really disappointed because limes are my favorite. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, great. They have a six pack of limes. Probably should have known because those those types of flavors only get packaged in the, like the 12 pack multi packs. So it's my own fault for not paying attention. But I was like, oh, great. Six whole limes. I don't have to like fish them out of a multi pack where there's two other flavors I don't like. Uh, no, unfortunately, it was green apple, but it could have been worse. Well, I'm glad that uh, that's going well. Uh, and the hot dogs, the regular Joey Chestnut. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Banned from competing this year. Are you aware of this? The scandal? Um, it, it's because of some kind of sponsorship thing, right? Yeah, well, it's obviously the, the, the competition is put on by Nathan's, and he was is apparently now sponsored by Beyond Meat. Uh, right, right, right. So I think... And I've heard two versions of it, and I did not investigate to see what the actual truth was. But one was that he wanted to eat beyond hot dogs instead of Nathan's hot dogs. Ah, okay. And the other one was just that Nathan simply said, you are not allowed to be like, you have to sign a new contract with the competitive eating 
agency or whatever, whoever puts these right. things on uh, in right, right. association with Nathan's and you are not allowed to be sponsored. Like they tried to like UFC Reebok it where it's like, you're not allowed to have any, anybody else, any other meat tube sponsors <laughs> anymore. And right. regardless, he, he, he walked away and, uh, and I guess there will be a new, a new interim world's champion uh, in his place. He, um, what did he do today then? Like, why have I seen him with 46 hot dogs sticking out of his mouth? In the... not... That's a good question. Did he do like his own event? Is he going indie? Looks, looks like it. Um, yeah, it looks like impossible. Did their, uh, did their own maybe? Oh, yeah. Because he's on a much smaller stage. Uh, but eight fifty seven hot dogs in five minutes. Uh, he he competed against soldiers in a five minute hot dog eating contest. And the, and the actual Nathan's winner ate fifty eight hot dogs today. So oh whoa! So well, I guess what do you know about that? Potentially would have lost either, even if he had competed in the in the major leagues. Uh, well, except that, uh, I guess there's a 10 minute, uh, time limit oh. at Nathan's and he ate, he <laughs> ate 57 in five minutes. Okay. So probably could have <laughs> crammed down two more then in the, in the five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, Hey, we've learned quite a lot today about, uh, Joey Chestnut and, uh, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I try to keep on keeping on.